big holiday. We do have a lot going on this day and time. We have many who are sick. We've got a lot of deaths. We'll go over those. Of course, Randy Holly is on his medication. Sean Kane, son-in-law of Glenn and Jan Hughes, has begun treatments at MD Anderson. I think he's supposed to return home on the 31st. Of course, Penny Gray has cancer. Linda Wagle Center has cancer. Linda Hood, Brenda's sister, is having some health issues. Of course, Asha Davis, we want to remember her as well. She will be having surgery soon. We do want to extend our acceptance to the Linda Watson family this morning. Linda passed away sometime last night. I think they will be meeting today at 1 o'clock, maybe to make the arrangements. Also, John Ed Gray, who passed away this past week. John was a big, jolly man. I knew him. He, we just have a lot going on. We need to do a lot of praying and knowing all things are possible with God. We do want to know that the services will be continued this week as we've been doing online. Also, Paula told me that Rodney, D, and Andy all had the COVID, so it's just going rampant. Katie and Eddie is at home this morning. Katie's having some hopefully sinus problems. There's probably others that we don't know about, but we know we'll be praying for you and all can have a good recovery. Hopefully, sometime in the near future, next year, we can all get back to seeing each other face to face, and that would be good. Those to lead us this morning, Jim Chandler will be leading the singing. Billy, <clears throat> Billy Grubbs will read the scripture. J.C. Enlow will have the opening prayer. Joe will do the Lord's Supper and the closing prayer as well. Jim will enter into our singing night. Our first song today is 138, Father Alone. <clears throat> and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. And after this song, we'll have our scripture reading and prayer. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Father alone will know all about it. Father alone will understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When death has come and taken our loved ones, it leaves our home so lonely and drear. Then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year? Father alone will know all about it. Father alone will understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home, 
home in the sky. Then we shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it <coughs> and by Father along will know all about it. Father along will understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it. Scripture lesson this morning comes from Acts 2, 34 and 30, through 36. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know the certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified. Would you bow with me? Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning with thanksgiving. We are thankful for your holiness, that we can look forward to a place that's far better than this earth in which you created, where sin dominates. Many lives and affects our life, especially for those that were in the bumming yesterday in Nashville, who were innocent and yet became guilty of the heart and the work of an individual or individuals. We recognize your holiness and thankful that there's a place better than this. We look forward to being able to come to live with you and be with you forever. We're thankful for Jesus who makes it possible. For the atoning death, one who lived under the law a perfect life, with no sin, and yet went to the cross and bore our sins, and became guilty when he was innocent, that we might be guilty and yet become innocent in your sight. Give us the faith and the courage and the boldness Proclaim the gospel in its truth and simplicity. We're thankful for men who respond, who have the heart to respond to the gospel, to live and glorify you. For the church that meets here, we're thankful and gracious for each member and each individual. Those on the prayer list this morning, it was mentioned, we pray that you would bless them and their families as uh, their loved ones take care of them. The nurses, the doctors give them wisdom to overcome the virus and the needs of each and every one. We're mindful of those who have lost loved ones, especially of her number. And we pray that you would bless their families. We're in a time when we can't even re give respect to the families many times because of the virus. We pray that you would bless them. Bless us as individuals this morning as we hear the lesson that Matt's prepared. We pray that it will penetrate our thoughts and our heart and our lives. That we might live out a glorified life in your name and honor. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we pray that we would reflect our minds back to your love and your mercy that you have had on us. Go with us now and forgive us through Christ we pray. Amen. For our invitation song this morning, we use number 520, Only a Step. And we'll sing all three verses at the proper time for encouragement. And now before lesson number 238. Holy, holy, holy. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Merciful 
Good morning. It's good to see everybody out, and see everybody with us this morning. And good to see those who are here and those who are online. I uh, appreciate all those who are here. Uh, let me check my battery. There we go. Hope everyone had a good holiday weekend, a good last few days. I know we've had some that are out of town traveling. We've got some, as Doug mentioned, that were uh, sick and not well. So uh, continue to remember those in your prayers and continue to remember uh, all that uh, we have going on. Um, as we go through this time and as we uh, get to this point again where uh, things seem to be ramping up again. So I encourage everyone, as Richard said last week, to stay safe and stay uh, healthy and, and, and do the best. Look out for uh, your family as you can. Uh, today we're going to continue drawing near to the end of our year-long study. Uh, we've been studying the one-word book. Uh, we've studied the different words every week. Uh, last two weeks we've been talking about God. We're talking about God's nature. Uh, we talked two weeks ago about the sovereignty of God, that God as the king, the ruler, the creator of all things. Then last week we talked about God as the father, God the father, that part of the Godhead. That is that main part, or, or the head part. And then in that Godhead, you've got two other parts, two, three personalities and one being. Uh, that is, again, a, a, something that's hard for us to fully grasp, but it's something we see in Scripture. And that is the second part of that Godhead. Is this, this second part is just as important as the first part, and that is the idea of Christ. And then next week, we're going to start the new year and talking about the Holy Spirit. The third part of that Godhead, and I was sitting here thinking as Jim was leading that song, uh, really how appropriate that song is uh, with what we are studying. And I mean for this whole month, uh, that song, Holy, Holy, Holy. If you ever looked at the words of that song, that song is written about the nature of God. And the writer actually writes those words, Holy, 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 three times to talk about the Godhead, the three persons. As a matter of fact, if you look in some older song books, even some newer song books, that fourth verse We'll talk about holy, 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 God in three persons. And that's what we're talking about today, this second part of that Godhead that is Christ. The part that we are probably most familiar with, the one we associate more with. And I want to talk about what that Christ really means. I want you to have an understanding of what the importance of that word Christ is in that part of the Godhead. And we could call this part of the Godhead the God's nature of Christ or the Son. What is the significance of it? Well, to understand that first, we've got to understand what that word Christ means. What is the Christ? Now, uh, when we look at some and we talk to some people, there are some people, and these are uh, biblically illiterate people, who believe that the name Jesus Christ is a full, proper name. They'll talk about this name, and they'll talk about this name either, again, being illiterate or maybe not fully understanding the concept, and they will associate this as if Christ was Jesus' last name. That is not the truth. That is not the fact. The word Christ is not associated with Jesus' name while he's on earth. He's never once called Jesus Christ on earth. He, they never realize that. The idea of Christ is, is not part of his name, but it is a title. It is a title for one who is going to come. A title for one who is coming in the future. When we look at the scriptures, we see this in the Greek. There was a Greek word named Christos, which is the transliteration we have today. You notice those first five letters. It's the word Christ. It's this idea of an anointed one. And then in the Hebrew, you had a word that was the Messiah. And that is the idea of the, again, anointed one. And we're going to talk about that. And in the, in, in the root of both of these words in both Greek and Hebrew is the idea to smear, to rub, or spread, or to anoint. And so what we see, the word cross, is that idea to show this, 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 this process, this person, or this thing that has been anointed, has been anointed with something, some a foreign object, and, has been, and in doing so, that anointing has set them apart for a special task. And so in both the Greek and the Hebrew, the word Christos and the word Messiah, both 
mean the anointed one. And in the Old Testament, there's a reference to the anointed one. Now, there's not just one anointed one in the Old Testament. And this is what I want you to see, that there are these ideas in the Old Testament of various people were referred to as the anointed ones, or ones who were anointed, not the anointed one, but they were referred to as anointed one. We see in the, in the Old Testament there were kings who were referred to as anointed. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 3, there Samuel is told to go to Jesse to find the next king. And in 1 Samuel 16, 3, just as God is speaking to Samuel, he says, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Notice God says, I'm going to show you who the next king's going to be, and what you're going to do is you're going to anoint him with oil. Now the idea of this anointing with oil was to pour oil on his head to show, to symbolize that he was the one that was chosen by God. We go on from there to go to verse 12 and 13, and he sent and brought him, him in. Now this is speaking of David. You remember the story? Jesse comes to, to, to where Samuel's at. Jesse brings his sons. He brings all of them but one, the youngest, the son he doesn't think can get this honor, the one son he's got out in the field. That, uh, Samuel goes down the line. He looks at each one of them, and Samuel says, okay, this is the guy. He's nice. He's old. He's well-built. He's handsome. And God says, no. He goes to the next son. God says, no. The third son, again, this is the guy. And God says, no. No, no, no. The first four sons, I believe it's five sons and all four sons, God says, no, no, no. And God says, ask him if there's another son. And Samuel says, do you have another son? And he says, yes, I've got one son, a younger son, my youngest of all of them. He's out in the fields. And Samuel says, go call him. Go call him and bring him to me. And then this is where we pick up verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and beautiful and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Notice, Samuel anoints David with oil. And as soon as he anoints David with oil, the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon David. Now here's what's interesting about this story when you read 1 Samuel. And just before this, you hear the Spirit of the Lord leaves Saul because Saul has turned away from God, because Saul has rejected God. Now David is anointed as the king. He is God's chosen he is God set aside for this point, for this job. And so here we see kings, and this is just one example, that kings were anointed before they took their place. Now were kings anointed, priests were appointed, were anointed, excuse me. And as in Exodus chapter 29, verses 7, then later in verse 29, notice what it says here. It says, you shall take, take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. This is God speaking to Moses, telling him about what you're going to do to Aaron. Aaron is going to be the high priest. He's going to be that, that head priest of all the other priests. And he says, you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for, uh, for his sons after him. They shall be anointed in them and ordained in them. So notice God says, you're going to start with Aaron. You're going to anoint him with oil. This anointing of pouring out of oil to signify that this is my call. And then he says, from that point on, every other high priest who comes after Aaron is going to be anointed in the same way. God's going to show his choosing, show his, his people, his high priest by this anointing. So the priests were anointed by God. And then finally in the Old Testament, we see prophets were anointed. Not all prophets we have recorded as anointed, but at least some were. These prophets that would be anointed in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 16. And Jehu, the son of Nisha, you shall anoint to be king. Now, now let's stop here for a minute. Let me give you background. This is Elijah at the end of his life. Elijah is worried about what God is doing. He's worried about what is happening. He's worried that he's the only one there. And God says, no, you're not. He says, I'm going to show you what you're going to do, but Elijah, your life's about over. And I want you to go, and I've got a job for you. Number one, he says, I want you to go to Jehu and anoint him the son over Israel, or the king over Israel. And two, he says, and Elisha, now this is Elijah, 
doing this for Elisha, his his successor, the next pre, next prophet in line. He says, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehalah, uh, you shall anoint with to be prophet in your place. Notice, and to Elisha, you shall anoint to be prophet. So in the Old Testament, you have kings who were anointed. You have priests who were anointed, especially high priests. And then you have prophets who were to be anointed. And those are the ones that God gave over and over again. But God said there was going to be another anointed one. God said there was going to come a time when there be one who was anointed that was both prophet, priest, and king. In Psalm 107, verses 1 through 7, this is what God said. This is what the psalmist said through the inspired word of God. It says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and your holy garments. From the womb of the morning and the dew, uh, the dew of your youth shall be uh, will be with will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of wrath. He will execute judgment upon the, among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he shall lift up his head. Notice what he says here. He gives a reference here that the Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. God said to my Lord that you're going to have a scepter. A mighty scepter. And he says also you're going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. You see, this is that introduction. This is that idea that there's going to be one coming this anointed one who's going to have a unique role that no one else has ever had before. No one else in Judah had had this role of being both priest and king. You see, when we look at the Old Testament, we see that priests came from the tribe of Levi. You came from whatever tribe your father was, sort of how we have our last name. Your tribe was by your father. You could either be of the tribe of Levi and be a priest, or if you're of the tribe of Judah, you may be one of the kings. But you could not be from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi. You had to be one or the other. But God says there's coming a man, a man that I will anoint, who's going to be a tribe, be of both tribes. The tribe of not, well, not really those tribes either, excuse me. He's going to be of a new tribe, a new lineage, one of Melchizedek. Now, where Melchizedek appears in Abraham's account in Genesis, where it talks about a man who was both priest and king of Salem. And God says there's going to be a man like him. And when this man, this prophecy is given, we go on from there to look at the scripture that Billy read for us this morning in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verses 34 through 36, here Peter is standing on the day of Pentecost. And as he stands on the day of Pentecost, and he begins to preach that message about the cross, he says, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool or your footstool. Now what this is, is this is a quote directly from Psalm 107. Remember Psalm 107 verse 1, that's how this psalm started. And what some people think is what may have happened here is a Peter may have quoted this entire psalm. He may have said more than just his first phrase, and this is something that sometimes writers will do when they're quoting in the Bible literature. When they quote another psalm, they'll give you the beginning words of it. And the idea is that if we know the Bible, we ought to connect, hey, he's quoting this psalm. He's referencing this whole book, not just as one part of this whole chapter, not just as one little part. And David, is, or, or, or Peter, is talking about Jesus and he says, this is the one, he's going to say that this is the one that God has made this honor. Matter of fact, getting a little ahead of myself. Notice what he says next in this verse here. He says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, talking about Jesus, both Lord and Christ, 
this Jesus whom you crucify. Now imagine this for a minute. Imagine the power of this statement. These words in Acts 2 are the first times, if I remember correctly, this is the first time that the word Christ and Jesus is directly connected. Up till this point, there have been hints that Jesus was the Messiah. There have been hints that he was the Christ. But this is the first time it is laid out plainly and says, this is him. This is the one. This is the one that we've been waiting on. He is Lord, God, King, and Christ, the anointed one. The anointed priest after the reign of Melchizedek, that man who would fill two roles in one. And therefore we see this idea of the cross as the anointed one. The anointed chosen of God. Now, why is that important? Why is that all important? Well, that is important to understand that because that gives us an idea of who Jesus was. That this idea of Christ was not a name, it was a title. A title that had been prophesied centuries ago that there was going to come become, becoming one who would fill this role of Messiah. The anointed one of God, the one who is a prophet, who is priest, and who is king. And that fulfillment, that speaking of that fulfillment, is seen all throughout the book of Hebrews. And it's all throughout that book that the Hebrew writer will connect those three terms to Christ. Now, we're not going to look there this morning, but that's where, we're, where we can go. But we're going to look now at the significance of that title, Christ. Why is it important that Jesus has the title Christ? Now, this is important for us today to understand this. Because we have some in our world, in our, uh, our culture, or even beyond that, that will say, yes, Jesus was a good man. There are some that will say Jesus was a prophet. You know, even the Muslims say that Jesus was a good man, that Jesus was a prophet, but they'll say he's not the Christ. They'll say he's not the Messiah. He's not the chosen one. There are others who can look at history and say, oh, well, he was a good man, but he wasn't the Christ. Why? Because if he becomes the Christ, then that connects something else to him. That calls us to do something with him. What I want you to see today is to understand that the gospel record, the New Testament record, will show us that Jesus is the fulfillment of these words of God to show that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and then to see what that Christ and the Messiah has done for us. Now you say, Matt, you may say, Matt, well, I, I grew up in church. I know this. Yes, you probably do. But I want you to be reminded. I want you to remember who you believe. Remember who you follow. When we look to the book of Matthew, Matthew is one of those interesting books because the gospel of Matthew was a gospel that was written to the Jews. And the point of his whole gospel is to show that Jesus is the Christ. He wants to reveal to them. That's why when you read Matthew, you see more quotes than any other gospel where he says, this fulfilled the word of Isaiah. This fulfilled the Psalms. This fulfilled whatever. Well, why? Because he wants the Jews to know that this is the Christ. You look at the book of Mark. Mark will write about the, the difference. Mark is written to Gentiles, those who don't know who the Christ is. So Mark reveals to us and shows us who the Son of God is. That there is something special, something unique about him. Luke has the same purpose, to show that there's something different about Jesus. And John wraps up the whole story to tell us the rest of the story, the rest of the things that happen. But for this morning, I want us to look at Matthew. Matthew will speak of these fulfillments of what was going to happen. We look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the, to the part, de, deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the cross, 14 generations. Again, Acts 2 is where those two words are put together, but here in speaking of the genealogy of Jesus, what does he call him? He calls him the cross. Because he's of that line of David. 
He's of that line of the king. Then Matthew chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, and, ascend, and, the, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them. Now let's stop here for a second. This is King Herod. King Herod the Great, when the wise men come and said, we've seen the star in the east. We've come to find the Messiah. We've come to find the king. Herod called all the great priests together and all the scribes of the people, and he acquired them where the Christ was to be born. They go to Scripture and say, where does the Scripture say that Christ was to be born? And we talked about this on Wednesday night in our devotional. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. Notice, where is the Christ to be born? They go back to the Scripture. They say in Bethlehem. You look at Matthew chapter 1. You look at Luke chapter 1, 2, 1 and 2. And where do we find that beautiful scene of Jesus' birth? The city of Bethlehem. The city of Bethlehem. By choice, by chance, no. By fulfillment. To prove that Jesus was the Messiah. He was that predicted Messiah that was to come. The anointed one who would save his people. He was the cross who was coming to fulfill the law, to save people. Very interesting scripture to me is Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, there you see Philip, when he is traveling after, the, the, after they put Stephen to death, Philip begins to travel. And what does Philip go preach? Acts chapter 8, verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And if you go a little later in that same passage in Acts chapter 8, in the latter part of that book, when he goes to the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, he catches him on the side of the road. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Psalm 50, or Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And the eunuch says, of who does he speak? Who is he talking about here? I don't understand. He's talking about himself or someone else. It says that Philip went up into that chariot and beginning at that scripture preached to him Jesus. The message of the Christ is the message of Jesus. The message that he is that anointed one. That he is the one who had been sent from God. Paul preached that Christ. In his missionary journeys, it's just one excerpt from all the trips that Paul made in Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. And Paul went in, went in as was his custom. And on the Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scripture, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. This Jesus is the Christ. This Jesus is the anointed one. And Paul wished for everyone to know him. He wished the Jews to come to that realization, Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, beginning verse 1, I'm speaking to the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness with bears witness in the Holy bears with, bears with me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the, pro and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is, uh, who is God over all Bless forever. Amen. Notice what Paul says there. For I could wish that I myself were accursed to save my brothers, the Jews, so they could do what? So they could know who the Christ was. They could know who the anointed, chosen one of God. Then we see Paul also speaking about this importance, knowing the cross. When Paul speaks to his readers, when he wants them to understand the gospel, the gospel that he preached. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 8. 
Paul says these words. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, that which you received, and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised, and on the third day, uh, his raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then, uh, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared to me. Notice what Paul says. He says, I want you to know the gospel, the good news of Christ. The message of Christ. The message that he lived. That he died on that cross. He was buried according to scripture. No, buried. And then according to scripture, he rose the third day. You see, that's the part that makes Jesus different from everyone else. That's the part that makes Jesus different from everyone else who's ever lived. Because a lot of people have died. We talked about that a few weeks ago. There's a lot of people who have died on a cross, criminals who are executed, who are killed on that cross, who were buried in the ground, and they stayed there. I said there's been billions and trillions of people in our, throughout our time who have died, have been buried, and they're still there. And there'll be more to come. As long as this earth continues on, there'll be more people buried. But there's only one. There's only one who died, who was buried, and came back. That's the anointed one. That's the chosen one. That's the one that we preach. That's the one that we believe. Why? Because Paul says here, notice the proof. Paul says he was buried and he rose again. He wasn't just rose again by the people saying it. He said, but the witnesses that saw it, he appeared to Cephas, Peter. Then he appeared to those 12 apostles. Then he appeared to 500 brethren at one time. Then he appeared to James, his brother. Then again to all the apostles, all those who had been calling. And Paul says, then last of all, he came to me. Paul says, I write a witness account. You want to believe that Jesus is the Christ? You want to understand this point? Understand what happens in the biblical record. There's a huge jump, a huge change that happens to these men between the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts 2. There's a major shift in their behavior. You look at the end of the Gospels. Jesus is arrested in the garden, and his 12 apostles are arrested with him, right? Or 11 apostles. Those 11 apostles are right there beside him during that trial, aren't they? There are 13 crosses up on that hill, or, or 14 crosses to accommodate all those apostles, right? No. What all those apostles do? They arrested the Savior, and nine of those apostles disappear. They're gone. They run. They hide. Two of those apostles follow him. Well, they follow him secretly of Peter and John. They follow him to the high priest's house. They mingle with the people. You remember the story? Peter denies him three times. Jesus looks at him the third time, and the rooster crows and says, Peter left in tears and sorrow. And then John is there at the cross. Of all those 11 men, only one man, only one disciple, one apostle is there at the cross. And even he's at a distance with Jesus' mother. Those, nine, those 11 men were afraid. They were terrified. They were shaking at what happened. But then we get to Acts 2. And the thousands of Jews have come together in Jerusalem. Thousands, if not tens of thousands. And those same 11 men stand up and they preach 
a gospel message. And we just read it earlier in Acts 2 when Peter looks on those thousands of people and I can see him pointing the finger when he says, and the Jesus that you crucified, God has made Lord and Christ. It's pretty bold to stand before thousands of people and say, you killed the Son of God. What happened? What changed from the end of Matthew to the beginning of Acts? What happened for that man who left, denied Jesus three times in the night and was crying in the wilderness and, and with just, just horrible suffering? What changed his heart that he could stand before thousands of people and said, you've killed him. You've murdered the Christ. The one God sent to save you. What happened? One thing happened. The gospel. The one thing that makes Jesus different from everyone else. Yes, he died on the cross. Yes, he was buried in a grave. But he rose the third day. Why were those apostles able to stand on the day of Pentecost and proclaim those thousands of people, you killed the cross? Because they saw him. They saw him three days after they buried their friend. They saw him alive. They saw him appear in the middle of a locked room. John tells us they were in the middle of a locked room where no one else was there. No one could get to them. Try, try and talk, figure out what to happen. What does Jesus do? He appears in the midst of them. A week later, he does it again. He appears to them and to all these people. Why? To prove who he is. Why? Because without that proof, without that proof that he is the Christ, there's no reason to believe him. And there's nothing that makes him any different than anyone else. He is the Christ. And as being the Christ, we have to believe in him as the Christ. You see, when Jesus proves himself to be the Christ, we have to make that confession that Peter makes. That confession in Matthew chapter 16. Before that death, burial, and resurrection, Peter believed it, but he may not have fully comprehended it. After that death, burial, and resurrection, he fully understood it. In Matthew 16, verse 16, he says, it says, so Simon Peter replied to him. Now remember, this is when Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And they give him a list of names. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says these words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed you this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, we have to make a confession. A statement. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe that he is the Son of God. Without that belief, without that understanding, there's nothing we can do. There's no point in believing. There's no point in being baptized. There's no point in any of that. Until we confess that he is the Son of God. That he is that Christ who came, who lived, who died on our behalf to make us whole. We have to confess that name above all other names. And by confessing him, we not just confess him with our mouth, we acknowledge him. And we acknowledge that he is the only Savior. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 through 25. The righteousness of God through the faith in Christ, yes, Christ, for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over foreign, our former sins. He had passed over former sins by giving us redemption. But notice where this redemption is at. This redemption, we talked about that word redemption, we talked about propitiation, we talked about all those words just last month. That salvation is only in one place, and that is in Christ. So I want you to connect the dots here. Without Jesus being the Christ, and without us believing Him as the Christ, then we are lost in our sins. Unless we believe and acknowledge that He is that Son of God, 
And unless we obey His commands and do as He's told us, we're lost. We must believe that He is the Christ. We must confess with our mouth that He is the Christ. We must confess with our actions He is the Christ. Because there's only one place that saves us. And the place that saves us is in Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He says, many of us as were baptized into Christ. You see, we have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen of God, the Savior, the, Savior, the Redeemer of mankind, the one that God, the one God prophesied about, the one who would be the prophet, priest, and king, that anointed one of God. We have to believe in Him. We have to come to Him. We have to be put into Him. We have to put Him on. And then finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, again, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Behold, if any was in Christ, in Christ. He is a new creation. He's a new person. This morning I want to ask you, as we bring this lesson to a close, I want to ask you, have you accepted Jesus as Christ? Have you accepted Him as the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, the One in whom all salvation comes? If you haven't, why not? And maybe you don't know what to do. I'm going to show you what to do. Or if you have, maybe we can remind you what you're to do. Number one, we have to confess Jesus as the Savior. We have to confess Him as the Lord, as Christ. You know, we have, whenever we have a baptism, one of the first questions we ask before we go into the water is what? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is the Savior? And every one of us who have been baptized made that same answer, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Have you made that confession? Have you made that confession of, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And then having made that statement, we go into that baptistry and we go into that water. Don't have to be baptistry. We're going to any water. And we're buried in that water. Why? Because that water is the only place that puts us in Christ. Not that anything special about the water, anything special about where we're, where we're baptized at. It's the idea of what we're doing. Romans 6 tells us we're reenacting the gospel. We're reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection. Have you done that? If not, why not? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, show it. Acknowledge it by following those steps of salvation. Then after that, Romans 6 tells us we rise to walk in newness of life. A lot in Galatians 3 and 1 Corinthians 5 tells us that we are in Christ. We are a new creation. We're no longer like the person before. We're a new person, a changed person, a redeemed person. A person who knows that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Savior. And a person that lives a life dedicated to Him. And his service. You know, we may very easily say Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Whatever, you know, whatever we may want to say. But do we just say it with our lips? Or are we saying it with our actions? This morning I want to ask you, are you acknowledging Jesus as the Christ? Are you acknowledging as the Savior? In all your life. If you're not. Then I encourage you to change your life. So that you are. If you're not a Christian. I encourage you to become one. To put him on that water grave of baptism. Have your sins washed away. Be made right with him. Or if you're a Christian. Who's risen to walk in a new life. But you stumbled. You've fallen. Come back to him. 
Repent of that sin. Come back and let Him make you right once again. Come back and see He is the Christ. The only Savior. The only one who could give us redemption. This morning, if you're not living a life in Christ, I encourage you to change your life so that you are. And we ask that if you need anything, you'll come as the other stand and have to sing. <clears throat> Jesus said, Come unto me, I am the way. Hearken the loving call, obey. Come for he loves you so. Only a step, only a step. Come for he bled for you and died. He's the same loving Savior yet. Jesus the crucified. Casting your head, be burdened down. Come to the cross. The You shall wear a glorious crown when he makes up his own. Only a step, only a step, come for he bled for you and I. He's the same love. Being Savior yet, Jesus the crucified. Open for you the pearly gate, loved ones for you. Now watch and wait. Terrible thought to cry too late. Jesus, I come to Thee. Only a step, only a step, come for He bled for you and I. He's the same loving Savior yet. Jesus the crucified. Be seated, please. <clears throat> now as we prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 752. When my love to Christ grows weak. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. <clears throat> When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane. There behold his agony suffered on the bitter tree. See his anguish, see his pain, love triumphant still in. On the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he spoke to his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us pray. Our Father, as we take this bread, 
we continue to remind ourselves that Christ gave his body to provide a sacrifice for our sins. And that we continue to observe this memorial at the command of Jesus until he comes again. At the same opening in verses 27 through 28. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink all of you of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's pray. Our Father, as we take this cup, we remember that Jesus shed his blood so that he might cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And that as we take of this cup, we continue to understand and remember the blood which he shed for our sins. Amen. Separate from the taking of the communion, we praise God for the many blessings that he's given us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so unto you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no more gatherings when I come. Let us pray. Our Father, we acknowledge that, that you've given us great blessings that are beyond our ability to number. And that you show us each day your continued concern for our well-being. As a father provides for the daily needs of his children. We pray that we might return unto you a portion of those innumerable blessings in obedience to your command, and out of a heart of gratitude for your mercy and your loving kindness. For our closing song this morning, we use 851, Blue Skies and Rainbows. And we'll sing the first verse. Are there any other announcements? Not we'll sing this and never close in prayer. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would fall. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful, we're thankful that, that you desire that we gather together to raise up unto you our prayers of gratitude for your great patience and mercy and love that through Christ you've given us access unto the great promises that await us in heaven. We pray that we might continue to place our trust in, in your assurance of your promises and that we might cling to you in the difficult times that threaten to pull us away from you. We pray that you would heal those who have suffered the loss of, of their health and provide relief for them and the families who care for them. We pray for the families in our number and of our acquaintance. 
in their grief, that you might comfort them because you know and understand fully the loss and pain that it brings. We ask that we might continue to encourage one another and bring others closer to you, that we all might encourage each other and praise you for your gracious mercy and loving kindness. 